Hi folks, Kevin here. Well, it's June 28th, 2017. Uh, yesterday, uh, or the day before yesterday, I had a little bit of an incident. Uh, I was doing some pruning, that tree up behind me right there. I was doing some pruning and uh, I ended up sprain spraining my ankle, exacerbating an injury to an old fracture in my ankle years ago in 1991. So I have had a slow things down a bit in order to uh, to try and give myself enough time to heal. So I thought what I'd do today is try and answer, uh, address some of the comments and questions uh, from some of the, the, the more recent videos. Uh, Kazana wrote uh, after seeing, um, what was it? Oh, the garden update video, um, wrote and said, uh, you know, have, have I been aware of Dr. Ingham's, Elaine Ingham's work that she's been doing? She, Elaine Ingham was at the Rodell Institute, I believe, uh, prior to starting her own website called the Soil Food Web. And, uh, and I think she is uh, certainly a very influential person in my uh, growth and development, understanding soil uh, microbiology. Uh, at least the introduction uh, phase to it and composting a whole variety of different topics and uh, and I think that her website site which I'll put a, a link in the description below the soil food web is absolutely an amazing uh, resource to to learn more about soil to uh, to understand the differences between the different fluids that we get from uh, extracts to compost tea and uh, various uh, definitions of composting techniques that are used and the benefits and drawbacks. Uh, she certainly offers courses as well and I think it's uh, it'd be really worthwhile for those people who are interested in um, soil conservation, soil development that they visit her site. So thanks very much Kazana for bringing that, uh, bringing that up in, in your comments. Kazana also wrote, she says, I do not understand how the weed mats are beneficial. And this was in response to, I'm trying to look at, oh, comments and questions that I, uh, that I did before. And I'll try and put a link, whether it's up here, <laughs> wherever the heck it shows up on, in the video. Uh, but she, she said, you know, could I talk more about the pros and cons of the weed mats? That, and since I seem to be a fan of them, uh, I've only been using weed mats now, seriously, for two full years. Uh, and this is going into our third year. Um, and it's a geotextile product. And there are many different types of weed mats out there. But before I, and the one that, that we use, I'll put a, uh, a link to the Amazon place that, that I got it from, and you can get it other places. It's a DeWitt weed mat. But before I go into much explanation of, uh, of the weed mats and, and the options that I have before me, why I'm choosing the weed mats in certain circumstances here, I think it's best for me to at least mention or try to explain, just turn this thing down, at least mention or try to explain, uh, you know, m where I'm coming from. So there's two different triads I think about when I'm, whenever I'm talking ab uh, about how I'm going to address a problem. So the first triad I think is referred to as the, the iron triangle. And the three uh, points of the triangle are cost, quality, and time. And the common thing that's said about it is you can have any two, but you can't have all three. So in other words, if you want something done very quickly, it's either going to cost you a great deal and have poor quality, or if you want it done really quickly and you want high quality, it's going to cost you a great deal more. So you can just put those three points on a triangle and just look at them and say, geez, you can only ch choose two. And time is really is something I really value tremendously, um, and the quality. So I really evaluate those threes for each specific situation that I'm trying to address. The other triad that I'm always considering with everything that I do around here is I'm looking at the investment. So 
it may be the investment of money, maybe the investment of time, and there are certainly other forms of capital that I could go into, but it's a, if I'm going to invest in something, I'm, I need to know, is this a degenerative investment, a generative dis investment, or a regenerative investment? Most people are very familiar with what a degenerative investment is. I mean, if you buy a car, or you buy a cell phone, or you buy a computer, uh, the moment you drive the car off the lot, uh, that the value of that item, as far as financial capital goes, decreases as time. There is a perceived or actual uh, planned obsolescence or devaluation of just about anything that we buy in the Western Hemisphere or now, it, you know, internationally. It's we're a consumer-based society, and unfortunately, even this cell phone that I'm using. The Nexus 6P, I really like it an awful lot, but I, it, I struggle with the concept that they make these things so it's so difficult to even change the battery. Uh, they want it to be perceived or actually obsolete when the technology that's, that's, that's in these phones is absolutely great. Now, I don't mean to get off on a, on a side tangent, but that's the degenerative investment. You invest in it once and the value of it decreases over time and so you're not getting the benefit uh, for, for a long period of time and it often has to be replaced. A generative investment is like our, our kitchen garden or our annual crop. We do spend so much time investing in the seedlings, the seeds, the, the soil, the in this case the weed mat, uh, whatever it may be and that investment is returned potentially if you do a really good job using that first try in and you get one return on it. Now there's ways of getting more more returns by seed saving uh, and doing other various techniques and I won't go into those not now but you know certainly using cover crops can can actually regenerate the soil as well but in general when we think about a kitchen garden or a typical farm uh, field a monoculture field or a vegetable garden those are generative investments. A regenerative investment, a good example of that is, geez, the, the apple trees, the almond trees, the peach trees, the, the, the plum, uh, peaches and plums and nectarines, the raspberry bushes, perennial bushes, uh, horseradish, rhubarb, uh, strawberries. Uh, they may not go on perpetually for years and years and years, but with, depending on your geographic location, your, your climate, your topography, your orientation, your water resources, all of these different sector components that impact your site, um, they will influence heavily uh, how much of a regenerative investment you have. Uh, so, you know, even let's take a, take a uh, trees that are lumber producers or so with some of the plants that we do they're, they're nitrogen fixers and we chop and drop them you could be picking up sticks and branches and feeding those into a, 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 a rocket stove if you wanted to or wood burning stove so there's other forms of, of uh, resources or energy that you can harvest from a and, and, and repeatable harvests and multiple different harvests from a regenerative investments. So I didn't want that to take too long, it probably did. But that's how I'm approaching things. I'm looking at what is the investment that I'm really investing in and what's the expected payback and in what forms will that payback come back? And then I have to look at, geez, I can either, how much time do I have? And there's some things, as you're probably getting the idea, there's many projects that we have going on here. Like right now I'm building the honey hut. I've got to get the greenhouse up. I've got to get the high tunnels up. Uh, I've got to work on the sugar shack, more, more finishing work in the root cellar. And then I've got to get to getting the, the, the renovations done in the workshop so that can be an educational center so we can bring people on site and teach them about all the things that we're doing. So time, you know, as we get older and we, and we have incidents in our lives, that time really becomes very precious. And the quality of our life becomes very, very precious as well. So 
that's where I'm coming from with answering these questions. So, Kazana, sorry about making this so long. So, the weed mats are not, the, so let me finish the first part of the weed mat thing that I started saying. Not all weed mats are, are the same. There's actually some uh, materials that are biodegradable, and, and I wouldn't call them weed mats, but they're, they, they may be a black, uh, let's say soybean-based, biodegradable, compostable plastic cover that you can put down, and, and it's, it's biodegradable, it's compostable, and you can plant your crops into that into that material and then you can just go ahead and harvest and post it well that doesn't allow me enough time as far as weed mats goes then there's the ones that like we bought at Home Depot or Lowe's or any place the cheap weed mats what are basically just one layer of a, a porous uh, geotextile and I found those to be more of a more of a hassle. You often people use it as a landscape fabric below wood chips, and then when the weeds get down in there, if the if they don't get the weeds out early enough, you're not cultivating, and getting them when they're just you know just a couple of leaves on the weeds, well then the roots get get interwoven into that weed mat, and you go pull it up, and it's a problem. Then we have like Kazana had an experience where when she pulled up her weed mat 20 years ago. The earthworms were dead. It was it was a, it was a poor system. So maybe it wasn't porous enough. It, uh, you don't know, or it wasn't applied pro appropriately. So this Dewitt uh, geotextile or weed mat that we use, which you can probably get any place in the world, has a couple of different layers. It it actually allows air and water to go through it very well. It decreases the amount of nitrogen and carbon that are lost into the atmosphere, and that I like an awful lot. It really decreases the chances of weeds. Well, certainly below the weed mat, if the weeds emerge, they don't get enough uh, sunlight, and therefore they die. Unless you have a perennial thing like the bindweed or uh, um, or quack grass, or some of these ones where the where the rhizome, the little side shoot that comes out of the root mass, slips up underneath the weed mat, goes out the other side, or finds the hole, and they start coming up. And we still have some problems with those plants. Sorry, just bumped the table. So, so that's an issue. Uh, so there's the different types of weed mats, and this is not extensive by any means. But in the future. Um, I would like to use in our annual gardens. Now we're only using these basically for the most part in our annual gardens. And I will use these inside of the high tunnel as well when we start doing our season extensions uh, for the animals that are here. So, uh, so I will use them for in those circumstances. What I'd like to be able to do the ultimate thing is actually putting in cover, cover crops using rye, using buckwheat, using vetch, uh, a whole variety of different uh, cover crops that we get them before the seeds mature on them and they're just chopped and use a flail molar, chop it up into small pieces and then we use a, uh, a swivel uh, rotary uh, plow to go down the paths, as you can see between our weed mats, we have paths of wood chips and other organic materials that are breaking down. And that material, when it decomposes and comes down in, and develops more into soil, that can be thrown up onto the top of the permanent raised beds. And then we're basically feeding them. And when you have a cover crop there, all the time that they're doing photosynthesis, they're taking nutrients and carbon, going down through the roots and feeding the microorganisms, relieving the, the, the need for amending the, the, uh, the soil each year. So the cover crop, and, and there's ways of planting directly into, let's say you roll down the cover crop, but cover crops, green manure, those things, as long as I'm not tilling the soil, I really don't want to till the soil if at all possible. So it, we had fantastic luck with the weed mats. Uh, the, the, uh, the worms are ubiquitous, the microorganisms are there, the food is very nutritious and, and does fantastic. So it's, it really is, it's a lot about time because right now uh, it, where we live, we've had so many uh, 
cold, wet, rainy, windy days. And that's another thing. So we have all the abundance of birds here and we have the windy days. So seeds blow in all the year long. And the little weeds will actually start to germinate, uh, weed seeds will start to germinate right on top of the weed mats, but they don't survive. Now, out in the, the food forest, you've seen in some of the videos, I do lots of cardboard and wood chip and some uh, compost as well. Well, some of the, the supposed compost, black gold from a mushroom farmer who's not too far from here, uh, he sells uh, shiitake mushrooms uh, as a uh, culinary uh, specialty and uh, his black gold. Well, what I ended up doing when buying his compost, I brought in quack grass, brought in bindweed, brought in those rhizomes because he didn't, he didn't use thermophilic composting techniques. He just piled it up and turned it. It would sit there for two years or a year and uh, he'd turn it before the people would come and pick up the, uh, the soil. So that was a mistake. And so now I've got bindweed and quack grass and other weeds as well all over the property. So that's been a bit of an issue for me. Uh, but out in the perennial forest, I use a cardboard. I, I do all of those materials. Now, could I use straw? Uh, if I could get good, clean straw, I would love to get it and start mulching the beds with that. That would suppress weeds, uh, add carbon to the, to the soil, and uh, give a food source for the mi microbial organisms to, uh, to feed on as well. So I hope that addresses you know, why I'm using weed mat. If I really didn't answer it well enough, please hit me again, and, and I'll give it another shot. <laughs> uh, let me see. Grant's Passage uh, made a comment on the thermal mass energy storage passive solar home video. That was, a, that was during the winter time, I think. He said, four ways for heat transfer, transfer absorption. Uh, absorption has multiple ways of interpreting it based on different definitions. So uh, absorption, when I think of absorption as a clinician, we think about absorption of, of medicines or nutrients through cell walls and all. I know that's not what he means. There's certainly the uh, like uh, mechanical absorption of, of uh, basically like water going into a napkin or a sponge. Uh, and then there's the one that I believe he's referring to. When we talk about physics, we can talk about the electromagnetic spectrum that allows uh, transfer of heat to thermal mass things like stone or water. And that's radiant heat that, that does it. So. I think that it's still the three that I mentioned, convection, conduction, and radiation. Uh, those are, are, the, are the means of heat transfer. So I thought I'd address that. Arnie Hancock uh, asks, I have a couple of questions. One is, do currents require acidic soil or an, an alkaline soil? Well, if you read, um, read about uh, uh, currants and gooseberries and all these ribe groups, they're, they're often talking about them needing, requiring an acidic soil uh, for the plants to, to prosper and do well, have optimal growth. We live in an area that, uh, that is all gravel and, area, and, and uh, the, my neighbors who are farmers, they're using lime truckloads of lime on their crops, uh, on their fields, in order to uh, reduce the acidity, raise the pH of the soil so that they can grow their corn and soybean. I, I think that uh, Dan told me, well, it's around 5.5, and, and it gets to the point where the farmers don't even bother testing it because they know what the field needs over time. Now, that's the, that's the modern agrochemical approach to, to managing soil. I believe completely differently, uh, and I've learned from experience. It's, it's really the, the a dynamic interaction between the microbes, the food sources that you feed the microbes, and the plants themselves. Uh, the pH in the various spots on our property, and it's, it was all stripped down. You can look at the, uh, at the uh, Hugel Pitts video that I posted previously, and I have some Google Earth shots showing when we ripped out all the trees and ripped out all the to topsoil, we, we buried that underground, 
and we're just left with basically a sandy gravel base. So it probably had a little bit of different pH in different areas. But I made another video about, um, uh, was it key line, dis no, not the scale of permanence. It was on, well, it was on soil, on the succession of microbes in soil associated with the, the plants that are growing on the surface of it. So the first things you would see once the, the land was stripped was a bacterial dominated soil. So we saw lots of weeds. But over time, as I changed the, the uh, organic material that was feeding uh, each area of the soil, we, I forced the succession to become more fungal dominated. And there's, I'll put a link up here, I guess, for, for, for that topic. Uh, so basically, what, what ends up happening is, instead of worrying so, what I believe is, instead of worrying so much about uh, what's going on with meeting the requirements based on, on some, uh, in some book or some website, at these are the requirements for the soil pH, it's always thinking about your soil comes first, feeding the soil. And these are the materials, whether it's cardboard or paper or wood chips or plant material and all. Uh, using those materials to break down, and it's certainly doing composting, break down and create the, the appropriate ratio of carbon to nitrogen or, or uh, uh, you know, when we think about the cellulose and lignans that are there in these woody materials, so that we increase the amount of fungal uh, domination. So if I wanted to put in a, a food forest area, I want it more fungally dominated. If I really wanted to have some of the herbaceous weeds that really, that really like uh, the bacterial dominated uh, soils, uh, you know, it's like, where do we see mullen coming up? Where do we see the yarrow first coming up? Where do we see these plants? Then I lean more towards the bacterial dominated. And, and uh, depending on what, what, the, what group the, the plants are in. So for getting back to the currants and hosta berries and the raspberries and all, it's, it's relatively just slightly, you know, it's right around uh, almost an even mix of those materials. So I add some compost, cardboard, papers, and wood chips to these, to these uh, areas every couple of years, and these plants have just taken off like crazy. I haven't checked the actual pH of the soil, but when I did it before, I went around with a probe checking the pH. It's, it's variable depending on what the material was that I was feeding the soil organisms. So, and that influenced the dominance, the, the predominant ratio. So we go from bacterial, uh, if we strip the land, we start off with just bacterial, which are preferable for the weeds. And then gradually we start getting some fungal organisms in, and we get some, a few protozoa, and then we finally start getting some um, bacterial consuming nematodes. And these are all microscopic organisms. Then we start getting some of the fungal uh, consuming uh, nematodes, then we start getting some of the microarthropods, and so the relative ratios, when we look at, at under a microscope, of the organisms that are on, let's say, 10 uh, uh, fields, we see the relative ratio of these organisms changing in different areas as the succession proceeds. So, I hope that wasn't too, uh, too much of a tangent. Uh, so back to the basic answer is, yes, they prefer slightly acidic soil. Uh, however, I th I'm one of those people who's, who believes in concentrating on feeding the soil where you're, where, where you're going to be planting these and trying to, uh, because what we do here is we feed the soil and the soil interacts with the, the, micro the communities within the soil interact with the plants and create the, the nutritional uh, profile that we desire for consumption for ourselves. I probably went way off on that. Oh, once again, Kevin. Okay, let's try and take another one here. And SC, uh, thanks for the video on your process. I Oh, this is in related to the uh, video that Thea and I did recently with harvesting and dehydrating the, um, the spearmint. 
Uh, I have cleavers I had, and red clover for our tea um, you know, throughout the, the winter, and they live in Michigan. The mullein will be ready shortly, and that will be next. Uh, what other herbal plants are you processing? So thumbs up for, for going out there and harvesting what's readily available in your environment. Those are awesome uh, nutrients. So I sat down yesterday when I tried doing this video and wrote down in Evernote a few of the, the plants that I know. I walked out in the garage and looked at some of our jars. So, so what, what do we have that I know about? I'm not mentioning too many of the culinary worms, uh, um, herbs. My wife could list all of those, uh, but yarrow, spearmint, mint, basil, plantain, comfrey, rose hips, mullein, red clover, echinacea, chamomile, uh, elderberry, dandelion root, rosemary, turmeric, ginger, thyme, lemon balm, uh, lemon mint, we'll be doing lemon thyme this year, uh, parsley, oregano, cilantro, and lavender. Those are the ones I could come up with pretty quickly. Uh, I'm probably leaving another dozen off and then the culinary herbs as well. Uh, we're pretty big into seed saving and, uh, and trying to uh, gather as much of the bountiful resources that are around us all the time, dill, <laughs> you know, uh, around here. So I think that's the last of the, of the comments and questions. I hope the audio showed up good this time. And sorry I'm a bit long-winded with some of these answers. For those of you who've hung with me to the end, thanks so much. It'll be a few days before I'm really able to do some of the work I want to do. I'll probably be doing a review of the uh, drone uh, soon as well. I've had some issues with that. I just want to make that, that information available to people who are, who are out there as well. So if this was pretty decent, <laughs> give me a thumbs up. Leave, leave comments. Ask questions. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching, folks. Have a fantastic day. Bye-bye now.